Hello, everyone. Welcome. You're going to give this just a few moments, uh, wait for our numbers to stabilize and for folks to log in, and then we will get this party started. Um, my name is Magna Gerardi. I am the event manager here at Book Larder in Seattle. We're in the Fremont neighborhood, um, and we sell exclusively cookbooks and food writing. Um, so thank you for thank you for joining us all tonight. Um, I'm here in Seattle, like I said, if you are listening from somewhere else, feel free to type into the chat and let me know where you're listening from tonight. And if you select the um, everyone drop down in that chat function, um, then everyone will be able to see your message. Right. Wait just a couple more moments. Okay, I think we're ready to get this started. Um, again, my name is Magna Gerardi. I'm the event manager here at Book Larder in Seattle. And it is our very great pleasure to host Rowan Jacobson tonight to talk about his new book, The Truffle Hound. I've got a copy right here. It's got some fantastic artwork, um, which you can't see right now because of the virtual screen. Um, he's going to be joining conversation by Langdon Cook and I'll introduce them both in just a few moments here. It looks like we've got Kirsten joining from Ballard. Welcome, Kirsten. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, so tonight's book, Truffle Hound, is a fantastic food writing book. It's all about um, being on the trail of the world's most seductive scent, follows a lot of extraordinary dogs, dreamers, and schemers, and we'll be able to hear a little bit more um, about the book. Um, for both Rowan and Langdon themselves. Um, but before we get started, I just want to let you know we will have some time for Q&A um, with both Rowan and Langdon. If you have any questions, please do drop them into the Q&A button at the very bottom of your screen. Um, the chat function that you see here on the sidebar um, can be used to just share your general comments and feedback, um, chat with other attendees. You see we've got Jennifer tuning in from Alexandria, Virginia. Welcome, Jennifer. And Christine is also in Ballard. Welcome, Christina, and thanks for being here tonight. Um, we have signed copies of the book, which is really fantastic. Um, so thank you, Rowan, for sending on those signed book plates. I will drop a link into the, um, the chat for anyone that's interested in purchasing a copy from us. Um, you can support this author shock by grabbing a copy from us or from your favorite independent bookstore. Thank you so much for your support. Um, we will have about 45 minutes or so of conversation tonight. And then um, after that, we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Uh, please do bear with us. Uh, we're really excited to have you all. Hi, hi Mara. Mara is joining from Santa Barbara. Okay, so let's introduce um, Rowan and uh, Langdon. Rowan Jacobson uh, is the author of the James Beard Award-winning A Geography of Oysters. Apples of Uncommon Character, The Essential Oyster, and other books. His books have been named to numerous top 10 lists, and he's been featured on All Things Considered, The Splendid Table, Morning Edition, and CBS This Morning, and in the pages of Bon Appetit, Savoir, and The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and elsewhere. He lives in Vermont, and we're really excited to have him here today. Um, Rowan's also joined in conversation tonight by Langdon Cook, Langdon is a writer, instructor, and lecturer on wild foods and the outdoors. His books include Upstream, Searching for Wild Salmon from River to Table, a finalist for the Washington State Book Award, The Mushroom Hunters, On the Trail of an Underground America, winner of the 2014 Pacific Northwest Book Award, and Fat of the Land, Adventures of a 21st Century Forager, which the Seattle Times called lyrical, practical, and toxic. Cook's work has been nominated for two James Beard Awards, a Society of Environmental Journalists Award, and a Pushcart Prize. He's been profiled in Bon Appetit, WSJ Magazine, Whole Living, and Salon.com. And his writing appears in numerous magazines, newspapers, and online journals, including National Geographic, Traveler, Eating Well, Outside, Gray's Sporting Journal, and Seattle Magazine, where he was a regular columnist for a decade. On-screen credits include the PBS TV series, Food Forward, the Travel Channels, Trip Flip, and the webcast Perennial Plate. 
It's my very great pleasure to welcome both Rowan and Langdon to the virtual screen. Thank you for being here tonight and taking the time to speak with our audience. Um, I know that they're all really excited to have you. So welcome. Thanks for being here. Hey, Magda. Thanks hey. for having hey. Thank you. Oh, there you are. Hey, Thank you, Magda. Right. <laughs> I'll let I'm you guys. <laughs> Thanks for those introductions, Magna. So Rowan, I think the last time I saw you, um, we were swimming in truffles at the Oregon Truffle Festival. But of course that was, you know, what seems like eons ago in the before times. Right, it was, it was the just before times, I think. Like we were right, we didn't know we were on the precipice of, uh, you know, of a world shaking event. We were just gladly snarking truffles. We were living it up. Uh, and you had embarked on the book project at that point, but I'm not sure if you'd done all the travel yet that would come. No, that was basically step one on, or, or leg one of what became a multi-leg journey. And you had already written at that point. You, you were onto the Oregon Truffle Festival before I was. Yeah, actually, I'd been going for a number of years. Um, and some of my best truffle experiences, I have to say, have been at that festival. And I remember you write about the, the meal, in fact, in the book, in your book. Uh, and that brought back some good memories of some of those dishes that we had that were just extraordinary. Yeah, I think I think um, a lot of people in the Pacific Northwest don't realize what an extraordinary truffle they have on their hands. You know, it's like it's one of the world's great truffles. There's no question. Well, I'm glad to hear that. You know, the festival is is trying to educate people out there. And that's kind of part of their mission to, to let everyone know, hey, we have some right here in our backyard. Um, but, uh, you know, I have to say, I just really enjoyed the book. Um, you really capture the intrigue you know, the food lust, <laughs> um, and of course, just the sheer eccentricity of the scene. There's so many crazy characters involved in the world of truffles, and, and I really want to touch on all of that um, tonight, but, but let's not get too far ahead of ourselves here. You know, there might be some folks out in the audience who are sort of more curious than committed to truffle culture at this point, and so perhaps we should just start by, you know, talking about what a truffle is. We're, we're not here to talk about chocolates after all. Right. If, you, if you're coming for the chocolate truffle talk, you're in the wrong Zoom, uh, Zoom box here. Right. Um, but yeah, but so chocolate truffles, I think that's actually a really good place to start because most people really don't know much about truffles. They, they think of chocolate truffles. Chocolate truffles were named that because of their physical resemblance to real truffles, which are balls of fungus that live uh, underground and smell insane. Oh, actually, I, I brought some show and, show and tell here. Um, actually, I wish it was smell and tell, but it, I was going to say, tell. yeah. So oh, this nice. is a pecan truffle. See if you guys can see that. So this is a native truffle of the US. It's found in the Southeast mostly. Um, it's milder than the ones you get in Oregon, but it's, it's a really pretty little truffle and it's got a nice, nice flavor to it. So this is what a truffle looks like. It's got sort of a marbled interior and then uh, a, a little sort of like dusty coated exterior and so what about you know all those molecules that give it that sort of famous aroma um do you want to talk a little bit about that because it's it's really more, more about the smell than the taste right yeah there's really there's almost no taste with the truffle it's a weird concept for us um we don't have very many foods that are all about smell but with the truffle it's really all about smell it's almost you can almost think of it like using, like how you'd use like saffron in, or another mm. spice in a dish mm -hmm. where you're just kind of trying to infuse the dish with these aromatics. And in the case of truffle, the aromatics are really crazy um, and purposefully so. Uh, it's, it's one of the only foods I know of that has really designed itself to try to drive animals crazy. Like you could say fruits do that. Um, you know, they want to be appealing to animals. Um, but they do it by packing themselves with sugar and by you know being bright colors and stuff like that. But a truffle wants to be eaten so it can spread its spores around. And so it's the smell of truffle is like two million years of focus group testing to, to figure out what works, you know, on many different many different types of animals, including us. And so tell us a little bit about your first sort of on the road to Damascus kind of truffle experience? Like what, what was the turning point for you where you realized that not only was this something that you really had to pursue, but that you were gonna write a book about it as well? 
yeah, I had never been particularly in, excited about truffles and it turned out because I never really had a good one. Um, the, uh, the truffle experiences I'd had were with truffle flavored products or a dish that it turns out was made with synthetic truffle oil. So truffle oil has no truffle in it. It's just made with a synthetic chemical. Um, so like many people that had been my basic experience of truffles was this sort of very stuffy, um, like, you know, old socks, synthetic experience. And then I just happened to be in Italy, in, in Northern Italy, which is the white truffle center of the universe uh, in the right time in the fall, th exactly this time of year. Uh, and there's white truffles all over the place. And I smelled a really nice one. They, they, you know, they'll, they'll have it underneath a, uh, like a glass bell because they really, mm. they treat them like, like gems. Uh, and I smelled it and it was, it was just immediate. Like, it was almost like, you know, that scene in altered states where suddenly like 2000 years of history flashes by in his mind. It was that kind of thing. It was almost, it almost felt like a drug, like conversion <laughs> of the road to Damascus. Uh, psychedelic. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and so that happened in Italy though. Yeah. Yeah. And I suddenly realized like, wow, this is, th this is one of the, great smells that nature makes. And uh, I immediately wanted to understand more about how it, how it does it and why it does it. And then as soon as I started to look into it, I realized that there were a whole lot of myths in, in the truffle world, which I'm sure you have hit as well. Um, so then I realized there was more story to tell because the stories being told were often completely made up. Well, you, you mentioned the truffle oils and that's definitely something that we should mention, especially for the audience. Because a lot of people who maybe think that they have had truffle experiences have had this sort of, you know, the sort of fake experience. There's a lot of leisure domain in the, in the world of truffles. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of secrecy and all of that. But then there's just sort of pure fraud as well, isn't there? <laughs> there is. And it's interesting. And actually, I'm, I'm going to I want to ask you a question about on that subject afterward. But there is there's. Um, there's the they're just they're they're there are organisms that like the shadows for whatever reason uh -huh. they're comfortable in the shadows and so the people who deal with them tend to be people who are comfortable in the shadows too it seems mm, like a bit um, sketchy yeah 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 they're subterranean in some ways so. but because i think partly because they're a wild hunted product it's impossible to regulate them and they've been sold through these underground networks not, not literally underground but figuratively underground networks um, that either wind up in Italy or France, but cover mm -hmm. all, all, most of Europe for uh, centuries, really. So um, there's been time for these these really rigorous but invisible networks to um, to develop, meaning it's impossible to regulate truffles. So from the time they come out of their secret spot in the woods to the time they get to a diner's plate, they're changing hands through people who are not being policed in any way, basically. Um, and some of them are very expensive. So you, you put those, those elements together and you get, uh, you get the potential for a lot of chicanery and, and, and fraud because there's some truffles that are much easier to come by that are much less expensive that can be passed off as the really good ones for people who don't know any better. But part of me is wondering whether, I mean, you know, in the Mushroom Hunters, you also, you, you hit a lot of um, quasi-legal and, and flat out illegal, um, moments right oh um, for sure yeah and so is it just that that's going to go along with any wild product do you think well i think so you know that had to do more with the people who were hunting the truffles um and this you know when i was writing about the truffle scene and there's a chapter in my book the mushroom hunters about it you know it was kind of pre-dog um yeah, dogs right. were just coming on the scene but there were a lot of truffle hunters out there that were just indiscriminately raking um, you know, and in the Pacific Northwest, most of the truffles are growing around Douglas firs. So they were going in these Douglas fir forests and just raking the moss, you know, wherever it looked like likely habitat. And um, that's hard on the ecosystem. You also get a lot of very unripe truffles by doing that. Whereas yeah. the dog, which, you know, has a smeller that's something like 10,000 times stronger than our own, can, can sniff out the ripe truffles and bring those to market. And I think, you know, that was part of the problem with Northwestern truffles. We were getting a lot of truffles that just weren't any good. And right. so people would buy one of those and say, well, what's the big fuss, you know, this, this has no aroma or maybe it's overripe and it's basically melting on the plate. 
Um, yeah. So, you know, once with the advent of the dogs, all of a sudden the quality of the truffles went up quite a bit. And the Northwest has really led the way on that. It's kind of like the first, because there's other, other regions that also had that problem with truffles being raked, like um, China and Iran, um, possibly Bulgaria. I've heard mm -hmm. rumored, but, um, but the Northwest is kind of the first place to change that and to create a, a culture of truffle dog hunting um, that hadn't existed. And now credit to that really goes to the Oregon Truffle Festival. Right. And yet the dog that they're using, the preferred dog is the Legato, right? Yeah. yeah. And isn't that a breed that, does it come from Italy or where were those dogs bred? And I think they were used yeah. for duck hunting or something like that initially. Is that right? They, they yeah, were water they're dogs? Probably, yeah, they're the progenitor of the poodle and they were marsh hunting dogs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they've got that curly water repellent hair. Um, then they drained all the marshes. <laughs> and, okay, excellent. Yeah. So they were out of work and they're like, what? So they, this was their next job. They, they got pivoted to truffle hunting and it turned out they were super good at it. They're very smart, very high energy. Um, so they've become the go-to truffle dog. And it's a bit of a cult, you know, they're very expensive right. um, and they are good at it. But, you know, the pro truffle hunters have told me that you, you take any dog when they're fairly young you make trouble hunting the most fun thing in the world for them and they'll do it pretty well. Yeah, I can remember at the festival, you know, the dogs were basically given the red carpet and, you know, they'd be escorted right into the elevators, you know, <laughs> sort of, they've got yeah. the prime treatment. Um, but yeah. uh, it's kind I of love that. Um, that. That to me is sort of like, that's a new version of truffle culture than what you see in Europe where- Interesting. And it's just, it's partly, it goes along with American, how Americans treat their dogs in general, which is, like a member of the family in Europe, they're more work dogs. They're often kept in kennels and, you know, trouble hunting is their job. And it's the one time they get out to, to go hunting. So it's more, it's a, it's a happy relationship, but it's a, a transactional relationship where mm -hmm. it, because I think because America didn't have a long history of trouble hunting, we're sort of reinventing it as this, this just fun thing you do with your dog and, and your friends perhaps. Um, and it's, it's a little bit less of a professional thing than in Europe, which I think is good. Yeah, and there's all sorts of people out there now that are helping to train these dogs and they offer these services. And you really, you don't need a legato. Any, any dog can be used to go hunt truffles. And my understanding is that that doesn't take very long to, to train a dog. You just kind of hide a sock with a, with a little truffle scent in it around the house for a few weeks, right? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And actually, you know, the, the, uh, the truffle dog company is right in Seattle. That, that, that's the sort of go-to spot for truffle hunting. Is that Alana McGee's company? Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. And you mentioned her in the book. Yeah. 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 She's great. And she actually has online classes so you can get started uh, wherever you are. Um, you know, she'll ship you a little, your little starter kit um, with your fake truffles and stuff. And then you do the online workshops. Right. And so, you know, we've talked about sort of the subterranean, you know, nature of it and the kind of shady characters. What about the truffle oils that people can find in the marketplace? I mean, how many of those are kind of valid? I mean, they, sometimes they'll have a little desiccated piece of truffle in the bottom, but does that mean anything? <laughs> <laughs> it means nothing. Yeah. That's means, presentation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They mean they stuck a desiccated piece of truffle in the bottom. And right. it's a cheap truffle, actually. It's a it's a summer truffle, which is a, a cheap truffle found, very commonplace in Europe. Um, right. yeah, those those volatiles, uh, the volatile compounds, really just can't survive any sort of cooking or processing. Uh, so they're they're not gonna. You can't get them into a product successfully. They're too unstable, too volatile. Uh, so you really need to deal with fresh truffles or frozen truffles. They actually freeze quite well. Um, They'll be mushy when they come out of the freezer, but the smell is all there. So if you just want to get like shave a truffle into a dish, you can work from frozen ones pretty well, but mm -hmm. not the truffle oils. I mean, if you like that smell, go with it. It's no worse than, you know, fake strawberry flavoring or whatever, but. Right. Compliments of a factory in New Jersey, you know, with a yeah. test tube kind of situation. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And they're actually getting better. They're getting closer to a decent approximation of truffle. Some of them are, but it's still, it's a whole different thing. But, you know, the interesting thing is that a real truffle still has that kind of gassiness to it that you could almost mistake for something that it has been concocted. Do you know what I mean? That's a good point. Yeah, no, it's, it's an insane smell. It is, um, 
it's not like if you were a human if you were like you know nature's nature's chef trying to whip up the smell that was going to drive animals crazy it certainly isn't what i would have come up with on, on my own i never would have thought of it um but it's genius it, it clearly works for uh you know half the critters in the forest yeah in terms of the people who are really turned on by it i've i've found that you know some folks just go to pieces <laughs> you know with truffles yeah. others are completely unmoved and wonder what all the fuss is about and then i i guess like myself i'm somewhere in the middle but i have seen people just reduced to tears at the dinner table over truffles i mean what is that yeah. just because is that something in their dna and the truffle is just working it over i mean what's what's going on there i had that same question and yeah it's it makes you realize that um, smell is, of the senses, smell is the, if you want to affect someone's emotions, um, if you want to hook them viscerally, forget vision, forget sound. I mean, that you can do it that way, but smell is the way to go because it cuts straight to your memory circuits, straight to where your emotional, emotional memories are formed. Um, so it's a shortcut to, uh, to creating a real intense bond with, uh, with your victim. <laughs> Right. And often you'll hear people use adjectives to describe it as like barnyard and, and naughty and things like that. There's sort of a sensual aspect to truffles. I mean, that that's another whole aspect there. Totally. Uh, and actually, I think you captured that really well in your description in uh, Fat of the Land. Um, I won't I won't quote it here because it's a little on the naughty side. But uh, yeah, right. But yeah, no. It, and you see that in in like you can go back a hundred years through descriptions of truffles that people have come up with and they go to that again and again. It's like this, this descriptions that use like sex and nostalgia and, mm -hmm. and it's, and, um, and like, uh, yeah, barnyard stuff, fermentation type stuff. And partly that's pretty accurate. Like the truffle is actually fermenting. It's got microbes fermenting inside it to produce these sort of alcoholic smells. So the smell is it's on a par with the complexity you get with a wine and for the same reason it's fermentation for sure you know one of the things i loved about your book was that i think you know those of us who have paid attention to truffles we know that there's been this great kind of european truffle culture especially in italy and france where you have the, the alba white truffles and the, and the black perigord truffles but you actually go to many other countries around Europe and elsewhere and discover that, you know, truffle culture is kind of starting to, to creep out of those sort of rarefied zones. I mean, even into England, for instance, do you, right. do you want to talk about some of the other places where you found truffle culture? Yeah. And this goes back to some of the, uh, the uh, sneaky dealings that you were, you were talking about earlier. Um, Italy and France have the two great reputations for, for having truffles, France with the black, Italy with the white, um, and certainly in terms of where the consumers are, that those are the two great cultures that have created truffle cuisine. But it turns out they were always like, they yes, they had their own truffles, but they were always bringing them in from other places and passing them off as their own. Um, so with the black truffle in France, they've been, always got a lot from Spain, and now most of the black truffles come from Spain. Uh, but the Italian white truffle is even crazier because Italy, you know, they, they promote that they are the center of white culture, of white truffle uh, production. But it turns but out you that, think they're the only place that had white truffles. Yeah, that's that's according the to the Italians, effort. right? Yeah. And they're getting most of their white truffles probably from Eastern Europe. So um, truffles can't read maps. They like that Mediterranean belt of limestone, basically with high pH soil. So mm -hmm. it's Italy and everywhere east of Italy to hit the, the Black Sea. So Croatia, Serbia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, even Greece a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's the, the white truffle belt. And all no one, dates, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they've all been, partly the advantage for Italy was these were places that had economies in the dumps, right? In the communist era and then the Balkan Wars and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's not like tourists were going to come to those areas and eat, eat the truffles. So they all just flowed to Italy and it actually worked for both partners. But lately, like you're saying, these Eastern European countries are, are kind of like, hey, we've, we've got the truffles, we can cook, um, come, come hunt truffles with us. So it's interesting. And you're seeing different versions of truffle culture arise in all these places and sort of pop above ground like a mushroom. And there are some other species as well that have 
you know, kind of stepped into the spotlight a little bit, right? You mentioned the totally. burgundy truffles. Um, yeah. And I noticed when I was hunting with truffle hunters in Eastern Europe, they were getting three or four different species, including the whites and, uh, you know, and the, the blacks, the famous ones. And then there's this other truffle that, you know, we'd only find a, a couple of a day, but they'd set it aside. I was like, what's that truffle? Um, it's, it's called tuber macrosporum. It doesn't really have a good name, except like the smooth truffle. Or the, right. But it was their favorite. Uh, they almost all agreed that was their favorite. They, there was no market for it because it's not well known. So they were just saving it for themselves. Is that one hard to find? I, I remember the passages that you wrote about that. And it was a truffle that I was unfamiliar with. Um, yeah, you'll never see it in a market. Um, but, but it's like, it's this catch 22 because you'll never see it in a market because nobody knows about it to sell it, but it's there. And so it, it just takes somebody, it just takes sort of like awareness. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's more stories like that in the US too. So I, I feel like with more awareness, truffle culture could become much more diverse and interesting and uh, equitable. Well, yeah, talk about that a little bit because in the US we have all these sort of interesting people from coast to coast really, who are getting into the truffle cultivation business. Yeah, and that's mostly with France's uh, black Paragord truffle, which is, well, at least in Europe, it was, it proved the easiest one to, to farm. Um, so Spain has had huge success with that. France farms it. Places mm -hmm. like Australia have had success with it. The U.S. has like jumped on that truffle maybe 30 years ago and started, and so to farm a truffle, truffles are symbiotic with trees. They grow connected to the tree roots. So basically to farm a truffle, you take an oak tree or another species, inoculate the roots in truffle spores and then plant the tree. So you're really a tree farmer, um, but your crop is underground or you hope it's underground. You can't really tell until it comes ripe a few years later. But so the US, hundreds of people have put in these, these truffle farms and most have never produced a truffle after like eight to 10 years. So it's spent really, a lot of money doing it as well. Millions of dollars, millions, yeah. millions of dollars. There are some that are starting to hit. It's starting to look like they might have figured it out, but it hasn't gone as well here as in other places for whatever reason. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, you know, with the different truffles that are being cultivated in the U.S., I mean, the black perigord seems to be the number one choice, but there are some others as well, right? It, you mentioned the pecan truffle, and then what about the Appalachian truffle? That was another one I had never heard of before. And no one's heard of that. And this is one of my um, my um, current obsessions. So or Oregon truffles, like the pe that's on some people's radar, and those are great truffles. And I think I think they're going to become a very big deal. But they are really limited to the Pacific Northwest. They need Douglas fir, and they have really short shelf lives. So you got to eat them a couple, within a few days out of the ground, like maybe mm -hmm. three three four days at the most. Mm -hmm. So. And they're not, so those truffles are not going to take over the world. They're going to be this awesome thing you go to Washington and Oregon for. So there's, and I thought there was nothing in the Eastern U.S. And most people believe there's no native truffle in the Eastern U.S. worth hunting. But again, it turns out it's one of these catch 22s where the truffles have been there underground all along, just waiting for a dog to come by. Right. Uh, there's, there's in the entire, from Michigan to Maine, to Texas, to North Carolina, which is the range of this Appalachian truffle, uh, there is a grand total of one human being who knows where to find it. One human being and one dog who, who know where to find it. Um, and they find it pretty easily. So- Is that the I, character you write about up in, Fran up in um, um, excuse, Quebec? So that guy is trying yeah. to farm it and it looks like he might have figured out how to cultivate it. Okay. And he has, we're gonna start seeing Appalachian truffle orchards in the eastern U.S. Mm -hmm. um, the other, the guy I wrote about, he's a in Maryland. He's like a retired attorney. He was a big mushroom hunter. He used to hunt for the restaurants in D.C. At, for his retirement hobby, and he happened to get a Lagotto Romagnolo from France. He didn't think there were any truffles to find, so he he was just out hunting mushrooms with his dog. And this dog was a prodigy who, without any training, began digging up these Appalachian truffles. So it's really thanks to this one dog that we have <laughs> That's the amazing. semblance of a truffle culture in, in the East. You know? So what about cooking with truffles? Do you have any tips for folks? I mean, because you, know, you look at old time cookbooks 
and the recipes are just atrocious. I mean, you cook the truffle for hours, you boil them, you roast yeah. them, you do all this stuff, which really would essentially kill the truffle. Um, these Absolutely. days, it seems like you just shave them very quickly over warm food, and that's that's about the extent of it. But how would you recommend to the audience that if they get their hands on some, you know, some prized truffles, what should they do with them? Uh, yeah, keep it simple. Um, yeah. Keep it really simple. So yeah, like you said, I think they're all best just shaved at the end over food. And if the food um, is warm and has maybe a little steam component, so it's going to lift up the aromas, that helps too. So, you know, the classics like pastas, risottos, um, anything, anything like that. Broths can be really good, but as long as they have some fat in them too, because fat will absorb the ar aromatics. Right, right. Yeah, I can, I've done some infusions before. Um, yeah, yeah. I've what have you, what have you done? Of, I've taken a stick of butter and put it in a little, you know, container sealed with truffles and left it that way for a few days. And the butter, the fat in the butter absorbs the truffle aroma. And then you can actually freeze the butter. But again, it doesn't, you can't freeze it indefinitely. You really, you have to use it fairly soon. Um, and salt, I've done that with salt as well. Yeah, but, and you can you can get a lot more bang for the buck, and the, since the buck can be pretty expensive, but it's yeah, worth. Pretty pricey. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you can get a lot more bang for the buck doing that, and that is actually the secret. I, I also uh, have to credit uh, the Oregon Truffle Festival for really pushing that infusion technique. Um, it's a it's a total game changer. It'll it'll those truffles, especially white truffles like the Oregon white or the European white, will turn everything in your fridge truffle flavored pretty quickly like i truffle hunters i know like their their wives have often like you know banned the truffles to a separate fridge somewhere in the garage or something so that the milk doesn't have to always taste like truffle but um they uh the, yeah you just put put the truffles with cream butter anything eggs eggs in the shell mm -hmm. anything that has um a little fat in it and will just absorb the truffle aromatics and you hardly need to use the truffle at all, except people would feel totally gypped if you did that. So you do have to, you know, shave it at the end. But it's really that infusion process is where you're going to get at least half of your uh, flavor from. Are you still in touch with some of the folks that appear in your book? I mean, I have to say there's some great characters. And I don't know if you want to talk about any of them in particular, but I mean, I could just list off a few that I really like. Mateo, I especially like the character K. I think of him as the uh, Transylvanian. Uh, he's the <laughs> one with the sort of thick Croatian yeah. accent who won't give his full name. And uh, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. you say something like his voice is somewhere between Dracula and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, a classic Balkan, Balkan character. Um, right. But these guys that you go traveling around with, they are just, they're really fun characters I mean, you're out in the woods with them and scouting around and sometimes it seems that you know maybe it's not so legit the places where they're going you know there might be yeah. a little poaching on other other truffle hunters uh you know woods and that sort of thing yeah very similar to what you've written about with some of your guys um but it, yeah the type of character that is drawn to either mushroom hunting or truffle hunting like it's a particular type of person and, and there's actually a lot of a lot of men and women who do it um, but they tend to, uh, you know, they, they're drawn into the mystery of it. They, they, they like being sneaky, perhaps they like mm -hmm. working with dogs. That's kind of a, a key part of it. Um, but they, and they're all often not that good at like the normal, you know, human business and social <laughs> parts of it, uh, right. maybe help, help them like help push them toward being truffle hunters, but they're always uh, really quirky people. Yeah. Yeah. Loners and schemers and uh, people who just maybe want to be by themselves in the woods a little bit. <laughs> right. And, and who think they're going to come out of the woods with like $2,000 every single time, even though like they get skunked. Frequently. Right. Right. What do you think about the fact that, you know, with the Alba white truffle, that's a that's a truffle that we really haven't figured out how to cultivate, right? Whereas, you know, with the with the black perigord and with some of the others, now that we've learned to, to sort of these truffles have stood up and raised their hands and say, domesticate me, you know, yeah. do you think that takes something away from them a little bit when they start going through the domestication process and they're not completely a wild food anymore? That's such a good question. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I was actually discussing that today with a, a woman you know, Connie Green. Uh, oh yeah. In fact, she gave me this. She told me, make, told me to make sure I showed this to you. Oh, nice. That's a that's a beauty. A, a fourteen for yeah. everybody. Yeah. Um, there's some concern that the flavors are not as good. Uh, so there, there's there's two parts of that question to talk about. I think which is the literal flavor part of it, but then also the sort of persona part of it. Um, so flavor wise, people are somewhat worried that when they uh, take a change a truffle from a wild food to a domesticated food, and you're sort of simplifying the system very much. It's really just mm -hmm. like one tree uh, with one truffle. And they're, they're probably not working with nearly as many different organisms as they are in the forest. It's, and they might not have all the same compounds to work with for flavor. So it, it's possible that it is a simplified flavor in those truffles. Um, and I, I, I hear those murmurings from a lot of people, but that could also be like, you know, something is farmed and it loses the romance. Um, but that's, I think the romance is important with truffles, right? Like part of the deal is there's this thing that's hiding out there and can't be found, can only be found by smell and can only be found by your, you know, your faithful canine. So it's a hunt, it's a quest every time. Mm -hmm. And when you find it, you, you know, you have this, you have this magical success um, and you don't get that with the farm truffles as much. So how much of the truffle lure is that? I think that's gonna be, like if they suddenly figure out the white truffle, then we'll, we'll have some answers to that. Yeah. You know, it, yeah, it's like in my classes, when I take people out, uh, one of the things that we often see in the woods is the oyster mushroom. And, you know, that's a mushroom that we have learned how to cultivate. And so you can go buy it in a lot of different markets now. But yeah. I just think that if you go out into the woods and find it yourself, well, there's the secret sauce, right? There's the yeah. little extra bit that takes it over the top and makes it special. Um, you know, with the mycorrhizal fungi, uh, which includes truffles, but also some of our favorites for the table, like chanterelles and like that porcini that you just showed everybody. Um, yeah. And, you know, lobster mushrooms and yellowfoot and all these. Well, actually, a lobster is a parasitic mushroom, but that's another story. Um, but, you know, with a lot of the mycorrhizal fungi, the whole deal is that you can't domesticate them. You have to go and find them. And it's interesting that the truffle, which is a mycorrhizal, you know, fungus, but seems to have lent itself to domestication, you know, in a way that's easier than some of the others. Like for instance, morels, that's kind of a, a holy grail for people uh, who want to yeah. farm mushrooms. And I've heard that the few successful attempts at actually producing a morel crop, the morels have tasted like kind of wet cardboard, you know. That's really interesting. Yeah. Most of those are coming out of China. Um, but uh, but yeah, they're not very good. Um, you know, with the truffles, it seems like they're still producing some a decent food product um but maybe the allure is slightly different well certainly like all all, all the black truffles the the you know the paragoids they're it's like 96 percent of them are farmed now and nobody's been complaining that they don't have any smell but some people are they, there's sort of new techniques developing um which are making the system even a little bit more industrial than it used to be it used to be you just plant a bunch of oak trees right um, so right. I wonder as they get, as, as we get farther and farther away from sort of any, any mirroring of the natural system, if the flavor will change, but yeah, so far the cultivated truffles, they've got their flavor. So do you think, you know, from all the travel that you did and the research, do you think that here in the U S that there is an emerging truffle culture? Like, did you get a sense that more and more people are getting turned on to this sort of food? product that we mostly associate with Europe. Yeah, well, I think I think Europe has good, done a good job of intimidating us on this one. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of like they used to- Kind of like wines in the old days, yeah. Right, right, we got over wine. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think we will get over truffles. And I actually think it'd be great if we, if we got over our truffle intimidation. Um, because like we were saying earlier, we'll, we'll sort of create a different, more grassroots version of, of truffle culture, I think. And from what I've seen, especially out in the Northwest, and I'm starting to see in the East, is that I think the dogs are going to lead the way there. I think, like in Europe, most people who are eating truffles are not hunting those truffles. They're just getting them in a restaurant or buying them at a, at a fair. Uh, but in the US, I think it's going to be much more sort of foraging forward. Partly, you know, the US has such a burgeoning foraging culture. 
And truffles would have always been a natural for that, uh, except you have to have the dog element, but that's mm -hmm. certainly not a deal breaker for a lot of people. Um, so I think, I think it's going to be different here. It's going to be um, more DIY, which is good. Yeah, I, I will admit that I found my first truffle without a dog. Uh, I, I wasn't raking either. Um, I went into a, a Douglas fir forest. I, I knew what the habitat was. And here in the Northwest for our, our white and black, you know, native truffles, it's always Douglas fir. And it's often the sort of forest where you might find chanterelles, a kind of a young Douglas mm -hmm. fir forest. It's sort of dark with a nice kind of duff layer to it and not yeah. too much competing kind of underbrush. You know, the ground is fairly clear with just that duff. And I was looking for the digs of squirrels, specifically flying squirrels and also yeah, yeah. voles. And so in essence, I was kind of stealing a truffle from a flying squirrel that had hit it in its little burrow under in the ground, you know? And <laughs> yeah, that is another secret is um, actually the guy I was just hunting Appalachian truffles with um, in the Appalachian mountains. Um, in, in a spot I cannot disclose, but that's what he 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 said. Look for the squirrel holes because right. squirrels they're all over these things, especially flying squirrels. Um, and so you'll see you'll you'll know you're in a truffle zone because there'll be these cute little little cups cup holes where the squirrels were were hunting them. Yeah, and you just have to reach into a few of them, and you might find a secreted truffle in there that the that the squirrel yeah. has, has put there for later. And so you're essentially taking it from the squirrel. And, but and often what you find, which is very annoying, is you just find the husk. Like the squirrel has eaten everything except that little outer husk. Right. So like, ah, damn <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> you know, but you don't get the really ripe truffles that way that only a dog could find. That's but the, the squirrels want the ripe ones too. So you okay. can, yeah. But but you got to be right on top of those holes. Like a dog will like be like, oh, there's a truffle. 30 yards over there, let's go get it. Um, right. So the do dog really saves you a lot of time. You know, I just noticed um, a little quick chat balloon pop up. So we should remind people to uh, post oh, yeah. questions. I don't know if Magna wanted to, to read some questions or. Um... Yep. Hi again. Hey, hey um, for anyone in the audience that has questions, you can go ahead and submit them in the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and let's see, Tina has a comment. Tina says, I think when a dog discovers a new truffle, we should name it after them. I want to eat a truffle <laughs> named Fido or Fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fun, funny, uh, that's a great comment. Um, so the Appalachian truffle we've been talking about, the, the guy in uh, Maryland who hunts with his Legoto, he doesn't actually call it the Appalachian truffle. The, the name of that truffle is still up in the air. He calls it the Legoto truffle. So he actually did name it after his dog. Okay, there you go. Yeah. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. So we do have one question um, from Kirsten. Kirsten asks, Rowan, you mentioned tuber macrosporum in Eastern Europe. Is it here in the Pacific Northwest? That one isn't. Um, that's purely Europe as far as I know. But there are, um, there's at least four super delicious truffles in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, which is as much as any region in the world has, like four that are considered like, you know, top of the line, five-star truffles. So there's two Oregon white truffles that are mm -hmm. possible to tell apart unless you're an expert. Um, and then there's the Oregon black truffle, which has uh, maybe the craziest flavor of any truffle. It's really fruity, like famously fruity. It smells mm -hmm. like banana and pineapple and like blue cheese and often mm -hmm. gets used in desserts. It's really good with like, yeah. ice cream, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then there's one called the Oregon brown truffle, which is the rarest, but it's, it's also got a really beautiful classic scent to it. Are those white truffles, are they now calling them uh, spring and summer white truffles? Yeah, spring and, uh, spring and winter maybe? Or spring and winter, okay. Yeah. It, it seems like in recent years, and uh, I'm probably behind on, on truffle culture a little bit at this point compared to you, but it seems like in, in recent years, they've discovered that truffles have a much wider kind of ripening time than they previously believed. Yeah, for sure. And dogs have helped with that too, because um, mm -hmm. they'll spot them. Even if you don't think the truffles are there, the dogs know better. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the, the truffles have wider ranges and they, they have a wider time that they, they ripen in. It's like, 
we're, we're, we're really only at the beginning of understanding anything about them, it seems. Now you have a truffle dog, right? <laughs> no, not really. I tried. I tried. You tried. We we had some excellent successes in our lawn <laughs> with, <laughs> with like you know planted. Um, but he's uh, he's eleven years old. He's got very short legs. So uh, we when, once we ventured out into the the, the real woods, he was kind of like uh like <laughs> you know back by the fire. Know about it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, we've got one more question from Christina. Um, Christina asks, which are the top locations around the world you would recommend for truffle curious tourists who want a slightly less touristy experience? Superb question. Well worded. Great question. Yeah, I love that. Um, so Pacific Northwest, Oregon Truffle Festival, seriously. <laughs> like one of the like, highlights of my truffle year, every year, for, for real. Um, and the other one I would mention is... Uh, a, a town called Motovan in Croatia. Mm -hmm. It's in the Istrian Peninsula. So basically right across the Adriatic from Italy. And um, this is a, a town that lives and breathes truffles. Like it is their, their major economy. They're surrounded by forest that is one of the most productive white truffle forests in the world. And you'd think you were in Italy, um, mm -hmm. like by the look of the place, like these beautiful stone hill towns and rolling hills. Um, and they were actually Italy up until like World War One, I, I think, um, or World War Two. So you feel like you're in Italy when you look at the menus too. But but everything is only about a third of the price it is in Italy, and fewer tourists go there. So um, it's uh, it's like this really relaxed way to enjoy the best of white truffle culture. So I'd highly recommend uh, Modovan and that whole Istria Peninsula. It's a uh, Although I have to say, Rowan, I was kind of dismayed by the level of the sort of canned hunt that you mentioned <laughs> in the book. It sounds like a lot of these touristy things, you know, they're, they're getting people out into the woods and they've buried the truffles ahead of time. And I didn't realize oh, that, man. It was, <laughs> yeah. that that all was going on. Canned. <laughs> a lot of canned all over the world um, because, you know, like, you know what it's like to hunt mushrooms. Hours in the woods, right? Like, and maybe you find nothing. And that doesn't really work for tourists who are on, right. know, they have a dinner reservation at six. Right. So, um, so I, you totally understand why they they do it. They, so they plan a couple of truffles. Actually, there's a really funny uh, Conan O'Brien skit that I saw just like last week where he goes truffle hunting in Italy and the Italian guys have totally planted the truffles. And he's saying that like, they can't understand what he's saying, but he's like, I think these truffles are planted. <laughs> he, really, he really works, uh, like, you know, works with it. It's, um, it's worth checking out. But I understand why they do it because tourists want to do this for one hour and they want to find at least one truffle, preferably three truffles. So they make that happen for the tourists. But uh, the stupid thing is that they lie about it and they try to pretend that they're not planted, which is totally unnecessary. Just say, we stuck three truffles out there. Let's see if the dog can find it. And it would be just a yeah. fun for everyone, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So that's what I think we'll see in the US actually. Uh-huh. There'll be more of that here in the Pacific Northwest, maybe. Yeah. I think that's well, that's one of the places you can actually, there's so many truffles in the ground that you can pretty much guarantee that you're at the right time of year, yes. you're going to find something. Well, it sounds like it's happening all over the world, even in Australia and New Zealand, I think yeah. you're right about, and, yeah. and elsewhere. So truffle culture is kind of taking the world by storm now. It is. The, the foraging, like all the other foraging, like, you know, foraging was the the tip of the spear that opened mm -hmm. up people's mm -hmm. eyes about this stuff. And that's what finally, like the Italians and the French, they blew it. They they tried to position the truffle as this super stuffy, super mm -hmm. fancy high-end thing that the, the tuxedo waiter would come and shave over mm -hmm. your food. And that's just not very interesting and off-putting for a lot of people. Um, so that is finally going away, I, or I think it's going to. It, it still lingers in Europe, but so yeah like foraging paved the way for, for proper truffle appreciation i think it was you langdon <laughs> oh, it was all you. i don't know about that i think i i think i was a little ahead of the curve there and and you caught it you know dead on um which is it's really just been so fun to read about your adventures um because you capture you know the intrigue and the characters and you know this burgeoning uh economy um which you know the whole just the the pipeline is is fascinating with these kind of big companies and then small 
guys who are trying to muscle in and yeah. it's uh you know you write about big truffle in in italy you know and it yeah. sounds like they're starting to lose their grip a little bit i think they are yeah partly it's technology is enabling the little guys to to skip over them but yeah it's all changing so it's an exciting time to start to pay attention to it all mm. all right we've got uh, a few more questions came in uh leslie asks can you share the name of the Truffle Dog Training Company in Seattle again, please? Oh, sure. Uh, the Truffle Dog Company. And yeah, if you just Google Truffle Dog Company, it'll pop right up. They're great. Truffle Dog. With Thank a, you. With an awesome little logo. You see the awesome logo? I did not, but oh, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it up. I love their logo. <laughs> Tina asks, can I rent a Truffle Dog? <laughs> <laughs> I don't you know. Love so this is, if you, yes, um, there's a sh huge shortage of truffle dogs. So all these, we mentioned how there's hundreds of truffle farms that have been planted around mm -hmm, the U.S. Mm -hmm. And they're just starting to finally produce truffles. And, you know, all these people who did this, they had like grand visions of how they were going to train their dog and their, but they never get around to the dog training part. So now mm -hmm. suddenly they're desperate. They have no way of knowing if they have truffles in the ground unless they can get a skilled dog to come in. So the few like you know high level truffle dog and truffle dog owners who are out there are in huge demand and they end up mm -hmm. putting miles on their car hitting different orchards and surveying them so there, there's a there's a call for more truffle dogs half okay. dog will travel <laughs> <laughs> that's that sounds like uh, the name of uh, another book there <laughs> <laughs> all right uh kirsten also asks can you each describe the best truffle dish you've ever tasted and where you ate it <laughs> all right i'll, I'll go ahead um I'm, I'm gonna do a curveball here uh i was in kentucky uh interesting winters ago um actually that's where the, the pecan truffle came from kentucky from uh, could you show us the truffle again someone is also yeah. asking they couldn't see it earlier if you want oh, to oh, too low. oh okay there you go there we go yeah Rowan, did that, did that come compliments of the former uh microsoft magnate who's yes, now in the truffle exactly. business it, it, yeah know? You got it. I think I interviewed her years ago as well before before she had started. Um, but she was at the festival for the first time in Oregon thinking about it. Uh, um, yeah, the, the Margaret Townsend. Yes. I yeah, think we both talked to her. Yeah. Um, so she planted a big truffle orchard in Kentucky on her parents' land and uh, did, got nothing for like eight years. Uh, despite huge input of labor and and cash and then it started to hit uh, just in the past couple of years and so i um i was there and um where she dug like some of the first paragords that had come out of her uh her ground and she was so moved by the whole thing that you know immediately said all right four course dinner um so we did all these courses and made all these great uh truffle dishes i made, I made like a truffled uh hollandaise sauce and mm. did it for asparagus um which was super easy to do and super good. But then we ended with an eggnog, a truffled eggnog made with the black oh. truffles. And um, it was just spectacular. It was beyond uh, anything. I, I, I couldn't have anticipated that it would be really good, but it was really, really good. Just like this pillowy cloud of like bourbon and bourbon because it was Kentucky. So like bourbon and, and truffle just uh, and cream, just really good. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, you know, my experience is similar. It was a dessert that I made. I made a pear crostata and I had black truffles that I had found and I just shaved them over that hot out of the oven. And uh, it surprises people, you know, truffles with dessert, but with the yeah. black, with the black Oregon truffle, that's a great combination because you you get those sort of that overripe pineapple kind of thing going on and it just it works. Um, but you know the the truffle experience that was probably my first really great truffle experience happened in San Francisco uh, with somebody else serving the food. It was at a trattoria in North Beach, which is kind of the Italian part of San Francisco, and it was just a very simple very simple pasta dish. Um, but like you were talking about, the waiter came over and did the whole ritual of, of weighing. The, it was an Italian white truffle yeah. and he weighed it beforehand. Then he mm -hmm. shaved some over the pasta and then he reweighed it. And, you know, the difference was what we paid and it was extravagant. But uh, 
but you know, it was a friend of mine taking me out to dinner and I was, I was happy to have those extra shavings on, on, on their tab. You know, <laughs> uh, it was, I have to say that Italian white truffle was really something else. And that's the perfect experience right there. Like, I don't think you can improve on that really just a really nice pasta, egg pasta, simple and, and white truffle and butter or olive oil. Yeah. It was like an Alfredo sauce or something, something very simple, but that oh, absorbed yeah. all that truffle essence, you know, it was, yeah. it was good. I have a recipe in the book for a truffle chawan mushi, which I think mm. be an awesome way to go. Cause you know, with chawan mushi, the like Japanese egg custard, they mm -hmm. serve it in a teacup with a lid Mm -hmm. um, traditionally. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of doing that with the truffle inside is that the truffle volatiles can't get out. So they fill that whole space. So mm -hmm. then when you raise the lid, you get this puff of truffle in your nose. I think we might've had that at the Oregon Truffle Festival. Oh, really? Oh, you know what? Yeah. I got the idea from Charles uh, Ruff who was there. Okay. Chef at the Truffle Festival. Yeah. He's oh, quite a character. Book. He's been, he's been doing that festival for years and he works with literally hundreds of pounds of truffles to pull that festival off yes which is crazy to see yeah it's like a bathtub full of truffles <laughs> i i'm so like fascinated by this idea of truffles and dessert i'm uh, very intrigued and excited to try to try it out if i can ever get my hands on some magna <laughs> have you had a good truffle experience with you know just sort of dinner truffles not necessarily dessert but just no. I have not. I feel like, you know, a lot of my truffle experiences have been like, you know, akin to what we were speaking about before, the truffle oils or the truffle mm. in, in yeah. fries, not true. Popcorn. That's Exactly. Sort of yeah. Truffle popcorn. Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I might have to make my way down to the, uh, to the truffle festival and check it out. <laughs> yeah, I think the truffle festival may be coming up your way too. I, okay. I have a feeling it's going to venture it's going to expand to uh, to include their their good neighbors to the north. I hope so. I can only cross my fingers here. <laughs> um, we I think that's all we have time for today. Um, it was such a pleasure to meet the both of you and um, to learn more about travels generally um, and to take a deep dive into the subject. So thank you both for sharing all of your knowledge and your stories with us and with our audience members. Um, we've got a few folks tuning in saying thank you for sharing the recipe in your book, Rowan, for truffle eggnog. It was the one that stood out. And Don says, I would be happy to bring you some truffles to try. Oh, thanks, Don. That's so nice of you. <laughs> oh, I know Don, and she she's a great truffle hunter and has a nice cookbook of truffle recipes as well. All right. I'll, I'll keep my eye out then. <laughs> yeah. So Don, we're gonna hold you to it. <laughs> I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna hold you to it, Don. <laughs> it's recorded. It's recorded now. It's recorded. Exactly. It's it's going it's on official. the internet. Yes. <laughs> it's official. It's official. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both again. Um, for anyone that is listening that wants to rewatch this talk, it will be posted on our YouTube channel within 48 hours. So keep a lookout there. And if you register, you will get a link sent directly to your inbox with the YouTube link and a link to buy the book on booklarger.com. Um, on behalf of Book Larder, uh, thank you all so much. Have a great night and um, stay, stay warm and dry out there. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Langdon. Thanks, Rowan. Have a good night. You too. Bye.